best thing I've read about open access so far is a report that was published by the Royal Society in 2012, Science as an Open Enterprise. It mainly talks about data and science, but it also gives the reasons for open access publications in all disciplines. And it talks a lot about intelligent openness. We can only achieve intelligent openness if universities work together and reflect on what we're trying to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it. That's one of the reasons that I'm glad to be here and to talk to you about how we're doing things in Oxford, but also over the last while to have heard about how you're doing it in your own universities as well. As Ian said, I'm Katrina Cannon. I'm the Interim Deputy Librarian at the Bodleian Libraries in the University of Oxford. I lead on the acquisition, description, conservation and management of collections in the libraries. And I'm the lead for the libraries on open access. I sit on a national stakeholder forum for open access, which includes librarians, senior university administrators, learned societies and publishers and funders. Um, I'm the University of Oxford representative on the League of European Universi Research Universities Chief Information Officers Group and I represent UK research universities on the subject repository archives, member advisory and subject advisory boards. What I'm going to talk about today is how we implemented open access at the University of Oxford. I'm going to spend a bit of time on our green uh, open access fo uh, focus, which is definitely something we've done, and then spend a little bit of time summing up what we think worked well. But before I get on to the main body of my, my presentation, I'd like to give a little bit of context to the University of Oxford and to open access at the university. <coughs> you can see that we have just over 20,000 students at the university and that they're almost equally divided between postgraduate and undergraduates, more um, undergraduates than postgraduates, and 10,000 staff. The income of the university for 12-13, which is the, the most recent figures we have um, proper statement on, is just over a billion pounds. And you can see from this chart how it breaks down. And I think most crucially for open access, you want to look at that green bit, the 41% coming from research funders. Um, I think that that is an important uh, piece of background to our open access implementation. Um, you can see that HEFKE and government sources is 18% and it's joint second place there. Obviously the HEFKE section would have been bigger uh, because it used to include the academic fees section but obviously it's got a lot smaller since then. And then a final ba piece of background information that's very important when considering open access in the context of the University of Oxford is the University Press, <coughs> Oxford University Press. The biggest university press in the world with a healthy scholarly journals portfolio. It is a department of the university and it contributes its profits back into the running of the university. And in 2012-13 that was £61 million. Pounds. So on to the main body of my presentation. Firstly, I'd just like to talk a little bit about how we were working on open access before Finch. I tend to think of open access as pre-Finch and post-Finch. Pre-Finch, um, in, the, in the green arena, we had our open access repository, Oxford Research Archive, and this is its front page. It was established in 2005. And we saw and see it as a repository and showcase for Oxford research, and that includes theses, particularly PhD theses. We also see it as growing into an institutional bibliography, and we see it as a place where digital preservation of the university's outputs will take place. The software we use is Fedora for the digital object store, and for the deposit, deposit software we use Valet, but we're changing over to a system called Hydra. In terms of gold pre-Finch, um, the payment of article processing charges was done by individual researchers or by their administrators within their own departments and academic divisions. There was no central administration of gold funds, so people wrote in their article processing charges into their grants individually and it was paid in that way. The only exception to this was welcome and um, that was administered centrally by the research services and the finance departments. Then Finch was published, the Finch report was published in the summer of 2012 and the Research Council's UK policy um, and mandate started to come, in, come out after that. I think the first thing that we as a university did uh, was to start to try and lobby for 
open access implementation nationally to take a form that we thought was the right direction. So the first thing really was for our Pro Vice Chancellor uh, for research to get more involved in a national lobbying and, and lobbying on behalf of Oxford University. But he was very much part of a national initiative as well. He worked with research, uh, the, Rus the Russell Group, and also um, with uh, ARMA, the uh, administrators <coughs> um, group. So he was asked to give an interview to the Times, um, Times Higher, and um, he asked the libraries to contribute to his response, which we did. One of the things we stressed was the financial impact of open access on a university like Oxford, um, because we thought it was going to be harder if it was going to be gold, which it looked like it was going to be quite gold focused from the Finch report. It was going to be harder on universities with a higher acceptance rate. After that, there was the announcement of the transitional funds from business innovation and skills for a number of universities. And then after that, the research councils announced that they would be giving block grants to universities starting in April 2013 and up until, we know, up until April 2015. And there was an acknowledgement, which hadn't been obvious from the start, that green forms of open access would be acceptable. So within the university, after that, we set up an open access steering group. And one of the great things about the implementation of open access in the university, and I've heard from colleagues in other universities that this is also the case, was the collaboration between different parts. So the libraries, the research services, the academic divisions, the university administration section, and of course within our own university, OUP, Oxford University Press, sit on our open access steering group, and that, that's absolutely great. I think that the involvement of the libraries, from my point of view as a librarian, but I do genuinely think it was good for the university as well, the involvement of the libraries from an early stage was very useful. <coughs> and our contribution was in two main areas and contri continues to be in two main areas. The first was um, the liaison and training uh, with academics, which subject librarians did anyway as part of their job. And they just moved into open access and, and ran a whole series of of workshops on how to comply with the funder mandates, but also you know, what open access was. And then, of course, uh, my own department within the libraries is the one that actually pays the journal subscriptions. And so it was, for me, it was a natural fit that they would also take on the processing of article processing charges. And that means that we have all the information about how, um, how much we're paying out to a publisher, um, and so we can negotiate better. The Open Access Steering Group, one of the first things it did was to put together a statement on open access. The University of Oxford does not have a mandate to deposit your publications into the, uh, to, into the repository. However, we did think it was an important thing to have a statement about the position of the university and to describe the situation as it was. So the main points of our statement on open access, which is available on our website, um, is that we're green for preference, um, but we also acknowledge that gold is widely used and it's supported by the university. An important thing at Oxford, I think, as at other universities, was that funding should not influence decisions about where researchers should publish. The primary consideration should continue to be academic suitability of the journal. And then finally, this, this uh, statement went through the committee structure of the university, very important in a university like Oxford to get as many people to say yes to it. And then finally, it went to the council of the university, which is the highest governing body, and they approved it. Another document that we made available on our website is our researcher decision tree. You may recognize this, um, an earlier iteration of this was the Publishers Association decision tree, which the research councils published in their guidance um, on open access. We wanted something a little bit greener, so we created our own decision tree, which is, as I said, available on our website. And because the university was supporting gold as well, we came up with a gold policy. It's first come, first served. Um, we used to have a situation where the academic head of department signed off the application. We have actually stopped doing that. The reason that we had that was we were worried that in a, position, in a situation where there was a scarcity of funds, people <coughs> wouldn't like the idea that librarians or administrators were making decisions about who got to publish and where. However, we haven't actually come anywhere near overspending the money, so we've temporarily removed that part of the process. 
Similarly, we divided the money up into quarterly chunks in case uh, there was a big rush on the money, and so that means nobody would have to wait more than three months. Um, we've divided it up into 80% APC payments and 20% to support green. Um, the other thing I should say, and, and it's interesting in the context of some of the things Katrina was saying, um, we haven't taken up any offers of prepayment or membership schemes from publishers for APCs. Um, I've been watching them all as they come out, I've been scrutinizing them and my colleagues have been doing the same. We don't actually feel that we're saving any money for the university, you know, there's no gain financially from, uh, from those at the moment for us. We're currently administering the process with spreadsheets and using the university finance system item by item. That is not sustainable and as things increase we are going to need a different sort of solution that can do that at scale. And that's something we're talking to other universities in JISC about. Uh, we have support and training for the researchers. As I said, the subject librarians have undertaken that. And we've also created to go with that our own Open Access Oxford website. And this is the front page. Um, and what we've also created is a lib guide, which is a dedicated page where all the information is paid that sits with our other lib guides in the, in the, in the library. We've an online ch chat and open access inquiries dedicated line. The thing we've been spending a lot of time on recently is compliance reporting. Um, back in the days when RC UK were saying how much money everybody was going to get, they also said what compliance rate they expected in the first year and the second year. And they actually listed how many articles that meant for each university. So University of Oxford is the fourth one down. It's very small, so you can hardly see. But it's actually 665 articles. So 45% compliance with the RCUK mandate means 665 articles published by RCUK-funded researchers in Oxford need to be available and seem to be available open access. And actually proving that we've done that to RCUK is, is, is actually much harder than you maybe might think, but you're probably going through the same as we are at the moment. So we are using a variety of systems. We're using ResearchFish, which is one of the RCUK research um, systems, and we're finding that useful. Unfortunately, we're not finding the research outcomes system very useful, and I understand the RCUK are actually winding down on, on RALS. We're using our own symplectic tool, which is our, our research system at Oxford. We're using Aura, the institutional repository, and of course the spreadsheet of open access payments that we're making. So we're trying to take data from a variety of sources, put them all together, and try and come up with evidence that we are complying with the mandate. Uh, it's been very difficult and it's shown us that we need, we need to, to manage our information with reference to our research outputs better. And one of the things that we're thinking about, again, in terms of paying APCs at scale, but also interacting with researchers who want to make their work available open access by whatever means, is we need a workflow management tool for open access. And one of the things we're talking to JISC again and our other universities is, could we develop such a workflow management tool together? And that, I hope, would help with compliance reporting. I'm going to talk a bit about our green focus. Um, there were two motivations for this, um, and one of them was financial. If you think about the fact that in Oxford, our materials budget for 2012-13 was 6.1 million. And of that, we spent about 3.7 million on e-resources. If you then think about the research, put, uh, research output for Oxford during 2012-13 being around 13,000 articles, if you were to multiply that by 1,750 per APC, you'll come out with 21 million pounds, which is a lot more than what we're paying at the moment for scholarly communications. That's very crude, and it assumes an all-gold world, and a gold world where you pay for it. But it is a guide, and it's one of the reasons that we, 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 we felt green, at least in the short <coughs> and medium term, would be better for us. 
So the pump priming money that we got from biz, from biz business innovation from and skills, in order to prepare for an open access world, we used to strengthen the ORAT, the institutional repository infrastructure, increasing the number of full text publications to a, sta a stage where we have now over 11,000 items, but also increasing the number of bibliographical records, uh, which is 142,000. Um, currently and making it easier to submit to Aura and make the various interfaces better. One of the questions earlier was what's stopping you from making your work available open access? I think we have to admit that um, institutional repositories, and I certainly say this for us, it's not as easy to submit as it should be and we would like to make it much easier and we have done some work to make it easier but we've still got further to go in making it easier to submit. Um, we want to improve the statistics available to authors and we've used money to do that as well. We want to use university and other sources to harvest information into Aura so we don't have to, we can minimize the work for academics and researchers. And we use the research information management system Symplectic. So Symplectic trolls other sources for us on the, on the web uh, for bibliographic metadata and then that comes into Aura um, and we, we do it that way. This is an example in Aura for a full text item with an Oxford author and the green uh, icon here shows that it's an open access item and then we have our own views and downloads icon here um, and a link to the full text item on the other side and then if you go further on into the full text item it's actually a plus one article and this is how it looks in, in plus one if you click on the link to take you to the full text. And then I think uh, earlier on, I think it was Alma Swan was saying that uh, we, uh, uh, no, I think it was someone else was saying it's, it's better if you can uh, make things available via Google Scholar. So we have done that. So this is the first item on this list here is the same article I've just been showing you. Um, and this is how it comes up on Google Scholar when it's indexed there. And then we've also um, made sure that it's available via our catalogue. So this is the library catalogue at Oxford, the resource discovery system. So that means that the open access research items can be searched alongside books and so on. So finally, uh, what things worked well? Well, as I said earlier, I think the collaborative nature of the uh, endeavour at Oxford was one of the things that gave us a lot of pleasure and also increased our own, uh, our knowledge of how each other worked and ultimately I think that's for the benefit of the university as a whole. Um, a lot of individuals were involved via their disciplines. So we have a, a historian, a medieval historian, who's very interested in the impact of open access on the humanities and has been very vocal in the debate. We have, uh, he's just one example. There are many people in the University of Oxford with their own views who are contributing to the debate. And back in the university, this makes for a very uh, lively debate and an informed one. And that means that when we actually do come to decisions, we have considered many aspects of the question. I think that's been one of the things that's been fun, though it's been hard work. We used the existing tools and infrastructure, so we used Aura, we'd had it since 2005, we used the opportunity to build it up into something better. We used the journals department for processing APCs and we used the subject librarians for training and help. The new website that I showed you, I think that was something that our researchers valued and we've had positive feedback for it outside Oxford. We didn't have too many policies and procedures. What I showed you is basically it. But everything that we had was approved at the highest level of the university and I think that's very important, especially in a university with distributed power structures that's governed by committees of academics like Oxford. And finally, I think one of the things that worked well, certainly from my own perspective and the library's perspective, was being prepared. Um, We've been talking and thinking, as many librarians had, about open access for a long time. And I had just begun to prepare a paper on the possibility of having an institutional fund for gold open access just in the spring before Finch came out. And we didn't, in the end, go for a gold institutional fund because we, we have the RCUK funds for the time being. But at least it meant we'd been thinking about it. I had written a paper and aspects of those papers that we'd all been writing on different things could be brought together and feed into our response on Finch and the university's response on Finch. Um, the things that we need to focus on from, from now on, 
We need to increase awareness of our repository. There are still researchers in the University of Oxford who don't know what Aura is or what it does. Um, we need, as I said earlier, to make it easier to use and easier to search, easier to submit. Of course, we, we need to come to grips with the Hefke policy and what it means for the university. And then in a university like Oxford with a big humanities division, uh, we need to Im understand the implications of open access for monograph publishing. And we have uh, an event coming up, a half day event coming up in June, where we've invi invited the chair of the monographs, the Hefke monographs working group. Uh, so uh, Professor Geoffrey Crossick is coming to speak at the university. We've also got a representative from Knowledge Unlatched project, which Oxford is participating in. OUP are going to talk about the OAPEN project, which they're, they're part of. And we've got somebody from the Wellcome Trust coming to talk about their monographs policy as well. So those are the things that we, I mean, compliance reporting goes on. But those are the things that we are going to be focusing on in, in the next while. We have got a rhythm going in some areas, so open access is becoming business as usual, but there's an awful lot more work to be done. Mm -hmm.